Hello everyone, welcome to our Let's Play series of Torment, Tides of Numenera. This is going to RPG as usual, and I'm very happy that you chose to join me today, because we're in the fifth eye. You notice that? You notice that again? I just loaded the game. Um, that's why it started with a little bit of noise. It's the outside noise, I think. I'm not really sure, though. I'm not really sure what these are. We don't really know all the things. I mean, we get hints. I guess we can theorize, but the game doesn't really give us... Too much of a reason to theorize, because it just keep, keeps throwing things at us. Last episode, we talked to Damo over here, and he's a charming fellow. He's a fantastic person, at, at least he seems so, um, because he didn't kill me, and he's, he can read my mind. And he told me uh, a few things about my mind as well. But now, now, well, we'll f with full pulls for everything, and also, uh, did he give me an extra intellect, or, or was that something? No, it was him that gave me an extra intellect. So, uh, let's ask him the question we came here for. Uh, the game it's just... Because it's loaded. It's, yeah, it's got that. You noticed that before, don't, haven't you? In some episodes, it's the first one I record in each session. Sometimes when it's loading the UI. And bear in mind, I'm running this on an SSD. So, it's, I don't know what that is all. Uh, the version I'm running now is a 1.0.1. I'm pre-recording a little bit, so uh, the new version might be up. But this is not the original one. It's the patched one. So, still, I don't know what that is all about. Hmm. Um, yes, he's looking for an adversary. That's right. Uh, I may have leads on that, so let's, uh, let's say that, yeah. Oh, I'm grateful for your help, friend. Tell me your suspicions, and I'll see if I can confirm or allay them to you. Allay, I love that word. <laughs> I just, I read it just once, and, uh, it's, yeah. Um, I talked to a being called O, definitely not human. Making a note. Oh, I have sensed O's presence and reached out to it with my mind. It is not an adversary. It's, um... Well, I don't know how to describe it, but rest easy, because O probably won't destroy you. Probably. Hmm. Could it be Clarion? I'll I also, remember that. I also thought of that. He burst out laughing. <laughs> I understand that her devotion to destruction might make her seem a monster, but like the rest of us, she is merely human. Hmm. The man in, yellow, in the yellow shirt who changed his shape. What about him? Making a note. Oh, that poor lost soul is not the adversary. He has been trapped in the form of uh, an abacus, but, uh, or abicush, but is not an abacus himself. Not to fear him, pity him. Or do not fear him, pity him. Yeah, well, I haven't talked to everybody yet, so, um... Uh... Clarence seems to hold you in high regard. She thinks you'd be a valuable ally in the Endless I'll Battle. I'll remember that. Oh, we've got more pressing matters closer to home. The adversary, remember? I'm not going anywhere until we've dealt with that nightmare. Hmm. Uh, and that's actually the reason why I uh, asked about the adversary first, uh, because I figured that, you know, I, I, I need to do that quest before. But there we go, we don't know all the things, and that means that we don't really need to talk to these guys, unless Sir Arthur over here... Is he one of them? Let's look at the quest, uh, the journal. Okay, so a call to war, and if I click over there, uh, it sh shouldn't it be the other way around? Like... The down arrow, I don't know, I designed my websites like that. Down arrow to open and up arrow to close. <laughs> anyway, Clarion has been... Yeah, okay, so... Who do I need to talk to? Not this guy. Hmm, Sir Arthur. This man has leathered dark brown skin and hair as white as the full moon. He peers at you from beneath long strips of eyebrows, sucking on a long pipe that has been made from either segmented wood or the leg of an enormous insect. His clothing is blue and formal, like a priest or a professor of some kind. All over him, on his belt, in every pocket, on both shoulders, even hovering in the air around his head, are glowing, chittering devices of all kinds. Let me guess, he sucks from his pipe. A ball of green steam floats away from his mouth. You're a traveler. That much is clear. An explorer, yet you have the look of a farmer visiting a teeming metropolis for the first time. He taps various relics on his, on his person. Never seen the like, have you? Fortunately for you, I adore education. Folks on the subject of Numenera... Uh, I adore educating fo folks on the subject of Numenera. I've also traveled extensively and seen much of the world. Go ahead, ask me whatever you would like to know. Um... Mm -hmm. So we learned about the adversary. Let's see, a metallic bud-like creature perched on the side of his head begins glowing. It crawls into his ear and he pauses as though listening. After a moment, the bug scuttles out and resumes its perch. He leans forward and lowers his voice. So you're a mind reader, hey? Well, I won't hold it against you, but old Arthur wouldn't walk into a bar of psychics without mental protection. So I don't expect to read much from me. Yeah, that actually kind of raised a few alarm bells. 
uh, because it, it might have been protection, and apparently it is. I, I figured it would have been from the original description. Also, the description we've been given about the uh, the adversary that might be in here is that they would try to seduce me to um, promise me things, uh, not just in, you know in the carnal way, not necessarily in the carnal way. But they would try to promise me things. How did you know I could read your thoughts? And actually, I can't read your thoughts. Well, I can. It's an... Uh, I can, actually. Yeah, it's not an amnesis. It's the, it's the other thing. It's the thoughts. How did you know that? Norman told me. He points at the bug, b now burying itself in his shock of white hair. He can detect that sort of thing. And then this one blocks it. He pulls a circular device from his pocket. I don't like letting people know what I'm thinking. Too dangerous. He puts the device back into his vest. That's the new disc, of course. My first psychic blocker used to melt brain matter. Provoked people to no end. Especially when uh, those who didn't know their friends were psychic. Hmm. Yeah. Because the, the, their friends were, would be dead. Is that it? I mean, if it, if it melts brain matter, you'd probably be dead. Who are you? I don't think he's, he's the adversary. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Goodness, forgive me. He stretches out his hand. Sir Arthur Torin. Traveler, explorer, and a lifelong student of the Numenera. I have seen everything between here and this steadfast, and I have studied Numenera of all kinds for decades. There is no man more knowledgeable about the Ninth World than he who sits before you, I assure you. Oh, can you tell me about the Bloom? I was... I, I would like... No, I, this game has, I think, a million words um, written. And uh, to give you a perspective, uh, the Age of Decadence has... I think I said this before, or maybe I haven't. The Age of Decadence has half a million words. And the Age of Decadence is... is it's incredibly branching in terms of just the dialogues and all that. Although this one, I can see already that uh, the mil I, where the million words come from because dialogues and interactions are just lengthier. So that's that's where it comes from. Um, and I said that because uh, why did I why, why did I say why did I start saying that? Uh, oh. Oh yeah, what I was gonna say is I would love something like in Fallout 1 where you can ask people about certain certain things like the bloom or I mean there's a lot of stuff that goes around or I guess you don't need that you only need what you have in Tyranny uh, or Pills of Eternity rather which is a, a sort of a glossary where you can check like the gods and all that sort of stuff and that's pretty good and I had fun reading that as well uh, of course I did that before the Let's Play so I would be a little bit informed and of, of course during the Let's Play as well but so why are you here if you're all protected against psychic? Knowledge, of course. I've traveled all over the steadfast and beyond, but I had to know what was beyond the beyond. Who knows how much time I have left on this world? I wanted to see for myself. Uh, why are you here in this tavern? Lib libations. Libation? I don't know what that word is. I should, because I know it, but I don't know what it is for. He lifts his glass enthusiastically. I'm trying to determine the nature of these fantastic liquids. Also, the people here are quite informative. No better place to learn about the city than its taverns. He takes a deep swig from his glass. Oh, boy. Well, like, maybe you would have told me about the, the things that killed me. <laughs> oh, boy. What are the Numenera? His, his eyes light up, as two do a, n a number of devices on his person, though you cannot see why. The Numenera are practically everything around you. We live among the detritus of uncountable civilizations, many of which were more powerful than you or even I can imagine. Everything they left us is the Numenera. Weapons, power sources, medicines, gels, plants, animals. Why, even the very drit in the ground and shins in your pocket are examples of Numenera. It's such a broad term that the Order of Truth has categorized the Numenera with terms like oddities, ciphers, and artifacts. Of course, any true stu student of the Numenera considers these categories too broad still. I have my own distinctions, but that is neither here nor there. He takes a puff from his pipe. In any case, it is the Numenera that power the wonders of the world, from an explorer's exoteries to the data sphere to the drinks in this very tavern. Actually, I... I don't know... Who wrote this part? But as a, I, I, I majored in archaeology. I said this before, uh, and one things, one of the things that I learned pretty early on is uh, a categorization has its own dangers. And historically speaking, the first archaeologists and actually the first historians, uh, well, not actually the first historians because that's a different thing. But the first archaeologists that appeared uh, still in the 18th century or actually 19th century. Um, they basically categorized a bunch of stuff. They, they, they found the artifacts and all that sort of stuff and categorized them. And it's really tricky for you to... You know, first off, there's the context. You know, you can't really tell... You know, all these ciphers and artifacts... I mean, they're, they're, 
pretty much the same thing, right? I mean, if it doesn't have... I mean, I guess the cipher is going to be a, something of use to you. But the problem is there's a danger in categorization, especially with stuff that you don't know, which is the case in archaeology, of course. Uh, context, context is very important for you to understand what, what things are, because for, for you, something might be a bench, and for me, it might be a table, or uh, like a, a place for me to tie my shoe. It doesn't, it's, you know what I mean? So it's tricky. You can, you can say that something is a tool or something is uh, furniture, where you can say that, you know, you know what I mean? So that's tricky to categorize. Uh, and uh, what I mean with this is that in, a, in the future, I think, especially science in general is working, walking towards, a, a, more towards categorization by, the, by, not really names, but like for A1, A2, it's like typification more than but more than categorization. And I think in the future, well, this is a different sort of future. These guys are kind of, uh, they're very smart, but they, they might be, you know, there's a, 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 anachronisms, I think is the word, basically where you have something very, very advanced on one end and then something very retarded, as in the sense of just old, uh, which is categories, I guess. So what's the difference between these categories? He takes a long puff on his pipe before answering. For the most part, he says, those terms refer to how useful a device is. It makes sense. As wonderful and powerful as the relics of the past are, nobody in this world gives a damn unless it can fix their problems. They don't care how it works or where it came from, eh? But if they can use it to feed themselves, fight off an errant crask, or at least get them a few extra shins, yeah, now they're interested. Uh, he shows you the back of his fist and sticks you out, sticks out a, tum, a thumb. Oddities are the least useful. They do something all right. Heat your drink, float in the air, make everything you say sound like music, whatever. So, again, you see this? Like, these are not... These are actually useful. You know, you can heat the drink, that's useful. Float in the air, that's useful as well, I guess. You can use it for... Uh, for levitation of small things, maybe, who knows? Uh, if you get enough of them, you can even levitate big things, maybe, who knows? Uh, make everything you say sound like music. That's just an outer tuner, that's amazing, if you're a singer. <laughs> but it's rarely something anyone can get any utility out of, he says. But yeah, I, I understand what he means. Oddities are fascinating, but pragmatically, they're only worth a few shins. Okay, so that's actually very useful, because we have a few oddities that... Uh, maybe he's gonna... Oh, actually, I think I sold oddities already, but maybe he's gonna be able to in identify some of ours. Especially the... The, the globe that we have. He sticks his, po his pointer finger in the air next to his thumb. Cyphers? Now, those might do anything. Heal your body, shoot a blast of flame, teleport you somewhere safe, and so on. But they're volatile. Whatever they do, they'll do it just once. And if you don't know what you're doing, putting too many together can give you what's called cipher sickness. He puts up a third finger. Artifacts? Won't do that. The term belongs to devices that last. Maybe not forever, but more than one shot. Hmm. I was actually going to ask, what happens to the, ci what, what's the name of the ciphers that actually have, or maybe, yeah, I was going to ask, but there it is, artifacts. Huh, pretty awesome. So what's, uh, what is cipher sickness? Terrible, just terrible, he sets his pipe down. Ciphers are volatile devices, as I told you. If you know what you're doing, you can separate, ins insulate, quarantine, that's carrying more ciphers than your average explorer without ill effect. Something on his person starts chirping, he taps his pocket on to stop it, but otherwise pays it no mind. But if you care, uh, yeah, I was gonna say he's probably get, uh, he doesn't have that, but mostly because he knows all this stuff. But if you carry more than you can handle, those ciphers react in unpredictable ways, draining your energy, wearing you down, or worse. He li oh, probably gave, gives you fetters, it's all, all that it is, most likely. He leans forward conspiratorially. This one time, I saw a cluster of ciphers bond to each other and gain what I can only describe as sentient. Sentience, or sentience, or whatever, ripped my ass assistant to pieces before tearing off into the cold desert. Haven't seen it since. A cluster of ciphers. Huh. He picks up his pipe and sticks it back into his mouth. Ah, it was completely unexpected. I felt bad about the assistant, but oh well. Science and all that. <laughs> Fortunately, most effects of cipher sickness are temporary, easily cured by simply getting rid of some ciphers. Using them. Sounds good. Uh, fortunately, although I'm sh hmm. I wonder if the game has like set effects depending on the ciphers, maybe categories or inner categories depending on what kind of cipher it is and then how they would react if you have too many. I wonder if that's the case. That would be quite interesting. And maybe if you knew all the, the ways that you could get cipher sickness to be good, I'm sure it wouldn't work though. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a sickness, right? So, how would you ca categorize the Numenera? 
Ah, fascinating question! He sets down his drink and leans forward. I'll give you the brief version, because you obviously have places to be. But put it simply, I am less interested in how useful the device is than in its means of function. He takes a quick puff from his pipe and sets that down as well. Now, the technology of the prior worlds is too, far too incomprehensible and varied for us to truly understand which civilizations created what. But we can define some ba basic categories. So, many devices deal with fundamental forces. Gravity, magnetism, sound, light, even time. Autom That's interesting because those are actually quite distinct. And uh, it's usually like gravity and inertia are basically the same thing. Uh, well, no, actually, wait a minute. No. But it, it's... Yeah, they're, they're all different categories, even time itself, apparently. Automatons and created intelligences can fall under artificial life. Biotechnology covers a wide variety of Numenera, many plants and animals that we consider natural were in fact created by prior worlds for some arcane purpose. The Bloom may fall under this category. The Bloom again. Hm. Someday I'll hire a team to find out, if I can find anyone reckless enough. There are chemical devices, as well as those dealing in various forms of matter. Metals, liquids, crystals, and conversion between the, bet, conversions between the three. His eyes light up. The most interesting are also the most esoteric. Nanotechnology, which, cover, which covers much of what common folk consider magic. Transdimensional tech and technol... Uh, Transdimensional tech is magic, or is that not considered... I think it is, because that... Yeah, because I would think that that would be magic. The technology related to data sphere, it's to the data sphere itself. Wait a minute. Is this some sort of like a... What is that? He leans back, reinserting his pipe. But these are just the classifications I prefer. The Numenera Defy definition. That, what, what is the data sphere? It's difficult to say exactly. At uh, most basic level, I, the data sphere is information stored within the air itself, but it, it's much, much more than that. Several of the prior worlds created similar spheres of knowledge around and throughout the world. Our term, data sphere, encompasses all of them, the connections between them, and the effects thereof. For example, uh, people talk about glimmers, visions from another place or time. These are actually some portion of the data sphere accessing human minds. Some ciphers, even some nanos, can access... Wait a minute. Oh, some nanos... As in, oh, I, I thought the ciphers would be a class. No, no, nanos are the class, ciphers are the artifacts. Can access arcane knowledge from the data sphere. Why even so-called telepathy? Sometimes two people communicating through the data sphere without realizing it. The data sphere as a subject of research is far too large for several lifetimes. Alas, I have only been able to spend my life delving into devices that seem to use it, but not the data sphere itself, or rather, the various and incompatible networks that comprise the data sphere. Perhaps someday. Yeah, time is a bitch like that, isn't it? So, uh, what are is es es esoteries? Esoteries? Whatever, that word, is the common name for any of various powers or abilities that cannot be explained by our understanding of science. Nanos are capable of esoteries more than most, but other people, and even creatures sometimes, exhibit powers that we would call esoteries as well. And w what about the shins? What are they? Oh, well, I read the description. He peers at you over his glass. Huh, you are new, aren't you? Shins are currency. The Aeon priests believe that some very ancient prior worlds used s specific metals or crystals as currency per their rarity, but of course, no metal is truly rare anymore. Half the nanos I've met can transmute metal into crystal. Why, I, I once transmuted flesh into gold, though not entirely on purpose. Uh, anyway, rarity is useless as a means of value, so the value of shins is necessarily a uh, social construct. Shins can be any coin, uh, any coin like an object or jacked bit of interesting material, though I think you'll find there is remarkable agreement as to what does and does not constitute a true shin. Many realms in the Steadfast actually mint their own money, but you'd be hard-pressed to find a traveling merchant who didn't accept anything you had on you at the time. Hmm, I guess, I mean, if the world is in shambles, then I guess they, they would accept it. It's m very much like the, the bottle caps in Fallout 1. Uh, how, how is Drit part of the Numenera? Run your hand through the soil, son, and you'll find it's hardly soil at all. It is filled with the microscopic remains of ancient unknown technologies and structures, commonly known as Drit. Why, in some places the Drit is even alive! He takes a sip from his mug. I don't recommend sleeping on the ground in those places. By the way, terribly unnerving for the visitors. Uh, what, what visitors? Me? Who sleeps? What about the Order of Truth? Oh, it's what you might call an organized religion. Except it's not a religion. Oh... Members of the Order call themselves priests, and their founder, the Ember Pope, but they don't worship anything, per se. That's not actually what a religion is, but sure. Except perhaps their own intellects. I understand that this town uh, has its own branch of the Order. They could accept your questions, uh, answer your questions better than I. 
Uh, okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you about something else. Oh, by the way, we need to talk to um, to um, Dama about uh, about our about our friends, about our companions. So, um, how do you know so much about the Numenera? Oh, cipher gathering was always the main source of income for my family. Alas, no more. But I have extended that pension into pure research. <laughs> It's not arrogant to say that mine is one of the greatest laboratories in the Steadfast, why an entire university has sprung up around my home. I specialize in research and experimentation. Prospective assistants apply almost daily, which is good considering how quickly we churn through them. <clears throat> what? How? What? What do you mean? Oh, assistants. Oh, yeah. I thought, because he mentioned the university, I thought he meant students, but no. Um, I, uh, I'd like to know more about the world. Oh, of course. Ask me anything you like. I've traveled all over the Ninth World, throughout the Steadfast and the Beyond. I even know a little about, a bit, a little about this part of the world, the so-called Beyond the Beyond. I have met explorers of all kinds and listened to the countless stories. So, um, what is it you would like to know? Okay, the Beyond is really interesting. What, what can you tell me about that? What is that? A wilderness between the Steadfast and here. Highly dangerous. His words seem meant to frighten, but he has an excited glimmer in his eye. Some of the most interesting claves and villages can be found there. I found one village whose uh, people hovered a meter off the ground from birth to death. The villagers of another would tell you the exact method of your future death, and I can say how accurate they were, though several of my assistants tendered their um, resignation. <laughs> Further out is the realm of most deadly creatures, landscapes, and weather. Oh, yes, he says, seeing your expression. The land and weather itself will rip you apart in several locations in the beyond. You've heard of the Iron Wind? Actually, I have. Well, it's uh, but one of the cruel rulers of that land, though perhaps the most infamous. A cloud of invisible machines altering the physical structure of anything and anyone it touches. He grins wildly as he, as he brings his cup up to his lips. Truly terrible. And I'm sure fascinating, if you can get one of those invisible machines. It's a cloud. I, I wonder how big the machines actually are. Uh, if they're like, I don't know. Uh, what about the Steadfast? What is that? Oh, much. I can tell you much, my friend. Too much, in fact. The Steadfast is a collection of kingdoms and principalities far west of here, all the way to the end of the continent. He blows smoke from his mouth. It forms into a purple ball and drops to, uh, and then through, the floor. Ugh. Seriously. What is he smoking? It's where the uh, Order of Truth holds sway more than anywhere else, he says. There are several different kingdoms along with scattered villages and aldeas, but they all swear fealty to the uh, Amber Pope and his Aeon Priests. By the way, aldea in Portuguese means... Um, it, it doesn't mean village, it means, it means a smaller village, basically. Like a really, really tiny village. Uh, like a settlement, but I don't know if it, this is an English word. But there's a lot of Portuguese-sounding words in this uh, in this game, which is interesting. I'm sure. Uh, I, I hope you guys um, like my my input on that, uh, because of course I'm Portuguese. He he utters a small growl. Sir Arthur does. The order requires nobles of the steadfast to fight against the Gaians. Supposedly a cult of, to the north. I've never been there myself, so I don't know the truth. But it sounds like a waste of time and resources, or a waste of lives and resources, if you ask me. That's why I keep my laboratory in the southern reaches as far as the conflict as possible. He sucks on his pipe thoughtfully. Granted, the order did ask me to leave after several incidents. But I was planning on moving anyway. Yeah. So what about the beyond the beyond? Huh, <laughs> you're in it, friend. They call it the Saga's Protectorate. Yeah, I kind of got that as well. He said, I know a little bit about this area, the b the beyond the beyond. I think, I think, yeah, that's what I got from what he said before. They call it the Saga's Protectorate, or at least this portion of it. Uh, there is the Saga's Cliffs and the Bloom nearby. Oh, yeah, I need to know about that. Can he tell me about the Bloom? Come on! He can't. <laughs> uh, I've heard of places like Harif and Murad Jolius far to the, w the east. I'm most interested to explore this valley of dead heroes I've heard so much about. Oh, I know that's an area in the game, by the way. Uh, I don't know much about the game, but I know that that one is it one. A place of... I think I, I saw it uh, in the uh, Kickstarter campaign. A place of... Uh, a place to inter the dead? Bound to be some very interesting relics in that place like that, in a place like that. Well, in truth, I am only a recent, a recent arrival to this place myself. You would do better speaking with the locals. Yeah, I suppose. So, what, what can you tell me about different kinds of explorers? Oh, brave and intrepid souls, my friend. Explorers comes in, come in all shapes and packages, but I think you will find that most people prefer to label the bravest explorers as glaives, nanos, or jacks. Glaives are the elite warriors of the world. The nanos are those who study the Numenera, using it to perform powerful esoteries, or as, as whatever, however uh, you pronounce that. You t he taps a yellowish ash from his pipe. 
Jack is something of a catch-all term. They are mostly pragmatic folk who know a little fighting and a little Numenera. Jacks of all trades, as it were, but the explorers of any stripe are useful to have around, especially if you're expecting trouble. I'm not really sure that would be good. I mean, for a main character, it might have been good. Uh, isn't the other companion not Algern, the other one? Isn't he a Jack as well? Or is he a Nano? I don't know. Um, why do they call this the Ninth World? An interesting question. He takes a preparatory swig from his cup. One would think it is because eight worlds came before us, but even a cursory study of the Numenera reveals far too much breadth and variation for there, there, for there to have been a, a mere eight prior worlds that created it all. Well, not necessarily. You're jumping to the conclusion that, uh, I mean, if, if it's how the setting is, that's how the setting is, but not necessarily. I mean, just think of today's technology. Uh, in comparison to uh, medieval technology, you're gonna see very big differences, and we're still in the first world, so you know what I mean. It's it, mm. one that one then might ask, what qualifies as a world? He, he says, well, we could say the first through eight, uh, the first through eighth worlds are defined as the most powerful or influential civilizations of their eras, but even that fails under the most basic reasoning. If the previous eight worlds we refer to were the greatest of the ancients, then what qualif qualifies this world? wherein we cannot even understand the most basic theories gover governing a time auger to be the ninth? Yeah, it's true, because you're not the great, right? The truth, I'm afraid, is that we call this the ninth world simply because that is what we have decided to call it. No more and no less. Actually, that's a very interesting reason, because this is gonna... I mean, the na the, the it's weird. It, it's something that we don't have in our real world. We don't call our world a, a thing. Uh, but would we... Would we do that if we were part of, 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 of a world as crazy as this one? I suppose we would, but how... You know, because this is just so heavily his historically influenced, and everybody does that, so it's gotta be, it's gotta be something... It's like calling Terra to, uh, to our planet. The official Latin name is Terra, so it's Earth or, you know, all that... All, all the f different languages, but everybody basically calls it Earth. Earth from dirt, it's what it means, dirt. The earth on the ground, that's that's terra. That's in Portuguese it is terra. We we say terra, dirt. And uh, terra is the name of the of the of the planet, so it's it, it's something that we as a society, we as a world kind of converge to, and everybody has a different world uh, a different word, but it still means at least in the language as I know, it still means the ground. And this is just too different, I guess. We don't have a, a parallel. La I'd like to ask about something else. Well, uh, that's all I wanted to know. And safe travels to you, good sir. Yeah, to you as well. I'm gonna go over here, talk to Dama over here, because I want to ask about my friends. Alijern and the other guy that I always forget the name of. Um, so, uh, can you tell me about the people here? Wait a minute, the people here? Huh. He smiles, a little wistful. Sure, but keep in mind, most of them can hear us. Who did you want to gossip about? The other bursts out laughing. He gestures around the bar. They've got all... They've... They've all got their story. Some of them aren't from this world. Some aren't even real. This summons another peal of laughter. He points his chin towards uh, around the room. There's Theboros, Zeob, and Leto, and oh, Feriok. Uh, we own the place together. We've fought in all manner of wars, battles, and conflicts. We've traveled for some, worn Asper helmets for another, for others, or projected ourselves across the world. But the worst was the adversaries. They were the true tests, the test for all of us. They forged our friendship tighter than any other experience could have. Oh, best part is, says Theboros, we've sacrificed our lives, our friends, and our sanity for a city that'll never know. They keep on with their daily lives and just assume the rash of madness is some effect of the Numenera. Give up the best part of our minds and they don't even care. Doesn't matter to me what rabble think, but it'd be nice to at least get some professional recognition. Now, we've been over this, Theboros. We don't do it for ourselves. We do it because it's the right thing. Uh, he's right, though. Why would you save a city of people who don't care? Whether they care is immaterial, says Dama. If they were dead, who'd be there to care about our actions anyway? We saved the city. Isn't it enough for us to know that? Well, to know... Do you need to know that either? It's, it's just... Hmm. You know what'd be nice? A parade. A pension. Maybe, you know, something from the city saying, Thanks for not letting our brains turn into jelly. Oh, God's damned house that isn't infested with insects and ready to slide into the sound. Oh, so you want to march up to the government square and tell them that they don't know anything about it, but you've saved the city from a menace they never saw, and you'd like them to fund your retirement. <laughs> I encourage this. I hear the madhouses are lovely at this time of year. 
Nah, uh, you see what I have to put up with? Ask for a modicum of respect and instead I get mockery. I don't know why he we pay any attention to this old gallow glass. Huh. <laughs> okay, well apparently we can't ask about our friends, but uh... What did you mean when you said some of the others aren't even real? Talk to Ziob. <laughs> okay, well, um, how did you all come to this place? Well, mm, it, it called to us. It was a beacon. It was warm and welcoming. The first time I set foot inside these doors, the noise from the outside world lessened. It didn't disappear. I can focus in here as, it, here as I wish, but I could let down my guard. Relax. I'd wager the same is true for all the others. Hmm. Okay. Uh, that's all for now. Farewell. Yep. And it just nods. Yeah, that's gonna be all for now because we're out of time. We're gonna continue talking to these guys. Quite interesting conversations. And again, I hope you guys don't mind me just delving into some considerations every once in a while about different things. I love that this game just forces me to think about different things as well. Just, I love that. I just love that because that means I'm engaging with the game and I, I just, I love that. Anyway, for now, I'm Colonel RPG, and this has been Torment Tides of Numenera. I really hope you've enjoyed it, and if you did, go ahead and leave a comment, like the video, but above all, thank you so much for watching, and I hope I'll see you next episode. Bye-bye!